Hear us eating, <laughs> crunching. Okay. They do. So, Sprinkling. <laughs> just, just quite as you can be when you get. Um, yeah. I am thrilled to get us started today. Um, say bad things about <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak, especially to uh, Caroline and Jordan and Sarah for spearheading everything. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> so I have my plan is to talk for about 35, 40 minutes, and then we'll have questions. Okay, so what is conversation analysis? Uh, well, uh, CA is a social scientific approach to the study of interaction that's guided by a qualitative epistemology and method. I should say in the back, can you read that up there? Is that okay? Okay. Uh, like most qualitative approaches, CA investigates and prioritizes subjects' understandings of the world. So CA initially brackets theory, conceptual models, and all of its tools like surveys, uh, because all of them contain pre-existing conceptualizations of what and how the world means to the subjects 
Uh, and in this respect, uh, CA is similar to qualitative interviewing, focus grouping, and I think traditional ethnography. Um, most qualitative approaches, CA included, uh, focus on how subjects understand the world and what subjects mean when they act in the world. Um, but CA additionally, and I think uniquely, uh, focuses on how subjects make sense or make meaning when they actually interact. And those two words are important, actually and interact. Uh, in terms of interaction, CA does not, I think, focus on social life generally, as ethnography might do. Um, rather, CA focuses on how people talk with each other when they interact with each other, uh, guided by the idea that most of social life is talked into being and managed through interaction in a variety of ways. Uh, in terms of the word actually, um, interviewing, focus grouping, and ethnography heavily rely on subjects or researchers' reports of their perceptions of how interaction works. And although there are definitely value to these methods, at least in terms of studying interaction, uh, they could be problematic. Um, for at least 30 years, research on provider-patient communication, at least, has struggled with an inconvenient truth. Uh, and that truth is that communication behaviors that are documented in audio and videotapes of actual care rarely are significantly correlated with either providers or patients' self-reports of the occurrence of these behaviors. So I'm going to show you a table from, a, uh, from an article. This research involved women 50 to 80 years old receiving routine care in general internal medicine context. And the goal of this paper was to compare patients' self-reports of communicative events, that's SR, with how providers then documented those communicative events in the medical records, and then also with whether or not those events actually occurred based on videotape records. And we looked at things like, did the provider discuss taking medication? Um, did the provider recommend making another appointment? Did the provider say to stress, or get more exercise, or alter your diet, or stop smoking? And then we compared uh, those whether or not those events happened according to patient self reports, medical records, and videotapes. Now, as you might expect, in terms of the medical records, they're bad when it comes to documenting concrete communicative events. That's not their job necessarily, so it's not their fault. But there were no significant correlations, okay? <laughs> and in some cases, negative correlations um, between patient self reports and what were documented. And that little cross symbol is that little cross symbol is p less than 0.10, which I'm not considering to be significant. Um, uh, and you know, in fact, medical records do not routinely document communicative events. And again, that's not a criticism of medical records, it's just reality. But much more interesting for my purposes um, is that there is an extremely low and poor correspondence between patient self-reports and, and the actual occurrence of communicative events. So in two cases, in yellow here, there was a significant correlation, but those correlations are low. That's probably not even a 0.65 sensitivity correlation or something like that. So it's not very reliable. And you might be saying to yourself, well, these are just reports of providers' behaviors. Surely patients are able to self-report their own communicative behaviors much better. No. Um, there's a lot in this chart here, but just focusing on things like, did patients ask questions about treatment? Again, patients cannot accurately report whether they asked questions uh, about treatment. Um, so I'm not saying that patients' perspectives are not valuable, uh, but they're just not accurate when it comes to reporting the details of interaction. And that's problematic for interviewing focus groups in ethnography, at least when they're trying to report the actual details uh, of talk. Okay. So I said that CA focuses on how subjects make sense or make meaning when they actually interact. Um, if subjects can't accurately report how they do this, then there needs to be a science to describe it. And that's what I think CA is. It's the science of describing how people do these things. So what does this all mean? Um, in healthcare, CA seeks to describe how subjects communicatively construct medical actions. So we're focusing very particular on medical actions. And we look at the details of interaction like grammar, word choice, prosody, embodiment, 
and all sorts of other very micro details for how those actions get constructed and recognized. So for example, for some concrete examples that I've looked at, uh, how do providers solicit patients' chief complaints? How do providers communicate that that's what they're doing with patients? And how does their communication matter for patients' responses? Or how do patients introduce additional concerns after the fact? Or how do providers make diagnoses or treatment recommendations? Or how do patients resist diagnoses and treatment recommendations? Or how do providers explain risks and benefits of medical procedures? Now, CA then, so that's a very qualitative uh, focus on how interaction works. Um, but CA then, I think, crucially focuses on a next step, which is how an utterance's meaning affects subsequent behavior. And we might call this the sequential effects of interaction. So these sequential relationships can be tested statistically, okay? Um, so for example, providers' questions can be nominally coded into different types to form independent variables. Patients' answers can be similarly coded to form dependent variables. And then, you know, pretty simple statistical techniques like linear regression, or sorry, like logistic regression can be used to test sequential relationships. And the nice thing about those relationships is that because interaction allows us to establish temporality, um, so for example, we know that questions come before answers, and because there's virtually no intervening behavior between these terms of talk, we can much more confidently establish causality, okay, causality. And then furthermore, these sequential effects such as question answer sequence one versus question answer sequence two can then be statistically associated with more distal health outcomes like patient satisfaction, treatment compliance, and those sorts of things. Okay, so I'm gonna exemplify this with um, four case studies. Uh, and here's the first one. So primary care, key medical moment is when providers solicit patients chief complaints as it happens here. Um, this is real interaction, not actors, okay? Uh, this patient ultimately is in for ringworm. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm Dr. Adams. I don't think I've met you no. before, Hannah. No. Nice That's to meet you. Phil Edmonds. Yeah, I was looking through your chart before I came in. Looks like oh, you've yeah. been a pretty healthy guy. I'm pretty healthy as far as I'm aware. Good, good for uh, you. What happened? Okay, so what happened? Soliciting, soliciting the chief complaint. So, you know, the first step in CA would be qualitative, qualitatively investigating all the different nuanced ways that providers can actually do that action, okay? Um, and I'm not gonna talk about all of those now, I'm just gonna talk about two. Um, but it turns out that there are about five systematic ways, each of which means something slightly different to patients. Um, so one way, one common way, for example, is with what you might call an open-ended solicitation of patients' concerns. Things like, what can I do for you today? Let me play this again, it's real. What can I do for you today? Well, I feel like there's something wrong down underneath here in my rib area. Okay, pretty basic. Other examples of this type of approach are things like, how can I help? What's the problem? What's going on? Now, this strategy, it turns out, is designed to communicate that the provider does not know about the concern, okay? That the provider has a lack of information to be filled in by the patient. Partially established grammatically. So in this case, words like what, how, index that the provider does not know. Now, the provider may know. The provider probably does actually know, but... Um, from the nurse or from medical records or whatever, but the point is that the question communicates that the doctor may not know. And if patients think that providers don't know about their concerns, then patients are much more likely to talk more about those concerns. Um, and a second feature of this strategy is that as an action, it requires patients as a first thing, the next thing in interaction they're supposed to do is present their medical concerns. Um, and that's what happens at lines three to four. I knew for you today. Well, I feel like there's something wrong down underneath here in my rib area. 
Now you may be thinking to yourself, well, what the hell else would the patient do in response to a question, right? Um, and it turns out that other strategies actually provide for other things that patients might do, which can derail problem presentation. I'll show you that in just a second. But before we do that, just know that when providers um, use uh, this strategy of open-ended solicitations, patients present for an average of 27 seconds, and they tend to present more than one symptom. Okay. Very different strategy is a request for confirmation. It turns out to be the second most popular strategy in primary care. Um, and this is when providers say things like, sounds like you're uncomfortable. Sounds like you're uncomfortable. Yeah, my ear and my, one side of my throat hurts. Okay, so they're not asking, they're just presenting a situation to be confirmed. And other examples of things like, so you're sick today. I understand you're having sinus problems. You're having knee problems since June those sorts of things. Now, this strategy is designed to communicate that the provider does know something about the problem. It communicates that the patient does not have to fill in the information to the provider. Here, the provider says, sounds like you're uncomfortable while he's visibly reading the medical records and the patient can see that he's doing this. So when patients think that providers do already know about their concerns, patients actually tend to talk less about their concerns. And the second feature of this strategy is that as an action, the first thing that patients are supposed to do interactionally is not present their concern, but it's to confirm or disconfirm with yes or no. In interaction, once you confirm or disconfirm, it provides an opportunity for the doctor then to come in and say something. Okay, so you can see this happening uh, here at line three. The patient first answers with yeah, and then only goes on to present her concern. Um, I'll play this for you. Sounds like you're uncomfortable. Yeah, my ear and my, one side of my throat hurts. Now you're probably saying to yourself, well, that goes by very fast. Don't patients always just go on to present their concerns? No, they don't. Uh, here's what can happen pretty frequently, actually. After patients confirm with yes or no, providers can then launch into history taking, effectively interrupting patient presentation. So here the provider is visibly reading the medical records. Uh, and request confirmation with you're having knee problems since June, and the patient confirms with yes, and then the patient wants, launches into taking the history. You're having knee problems since June. Yes. Okay, what have you done for that since then? Okay, now looking at the second strategy, uh, patients present for an average of 12 seconds, and they actually present one or less or fewer symptoms. Sometimes they can just not present any symptoms at all. And ultimately, we're able to show that adjusting for patients' age, race, sex, a bunch of demographics, that requests for confirmation result in significantly shorter problem presentations that also have significantly fewer symptoms attached to them. And then we wanted to move beyond those sequential effects to actually more distal outcomes. So then we wanted to link those strategies to post-visit satisfaction. Um, and we looked at two dimensions. We looked at immediately after the visit, we asked patients about listening behavior with survey items like the doctor gave me a chance to say what was really on my mind and I felt really understood by the doctor. Second dimension was relational style measured with items like after talking to the doctor, I felt much better about my problems and the doctor accepted me as a person. And what we found was compared to providers who used requests for confirmation, those who used open-ended solicitations were rated by patients as being significantly better listeners and as having a significantly warmer relational style. So you can see sequential effects and then relating the sequential effects to more distal outcomes. Uh, second case study uh, involved how providers get parents to vaccinate their kids. Um, using CA, we discovered that there are two basic strategies. And this discovery involved videotaping several hundred visits of actual care and then qualitatively determining when and how providers were using the vaccine, uh, were initiating these vaccine discussions. Um, we called the first strategy a presumptive initiation. And these are utterances that linguistically presuppose or presume that the patients will vaccinate. That vaccination is just a done deal and all you have to do is just agree to it. Um, examples include things like, we have to do shots, or we're going to do three shots in the drink, okay? Or so for vaccines, you only he gets the same ones he got at two months, 
Um, so here's an example of a presumptive format. Um, play this. Um, so for vaccines, he gets the ones he got at two months plus okay. the flu shot. Okay. Okay. Uh, and you can see that at lines three and four, the patient accepts the presumptive proposals with okay. And very commonly, that's what patients do, parents do. They just accept. Um, the second strategy was uh, what we call the participatory initiation. And these utterances, these utterances that linguistically presuppose that it's the parents that have the latitude to make the decision um, themselves. So examples included things like, are we going to do shots today? Uh, what do you want to do by shots? Or it also included formats that linguistically presuppose that they weren't going to vaccinate. So things like, you're still declining shots. So here's a participatory format. We'll play this. So any thoughts you guys had on the, the normal one year shots, which you may or may not want to do? Uh, I think I just want to do the Okay, so in this case, the patient resists full vaccination by, quote, just doing the pneumococcal, and she ends up refusing all of her vaccines. Um, so here's a figure from our uh, initial, more qualitative uh, study. And once we use CA to isolate the recurrent sequences and sequential trajectories, we were then able to code for those sequences. So basically, we started off with, you know, who ultimately initiates the vaccine recommendation. Is it the parent, 13% or the provider? Most of the time, sometimes there was no plan verbalized. If it was the provider, did they use a presumptive format or a participatory format? And we had a code book designed to code for those. We were able to achieve reliability in coding for those. How does the parent respond? Do they accept right outright with a participatory? Not very often. Okay, do they resist? Pretty often. Um, but presumptive, they accepted 74% of the time, they resisted 26, we were able to code for resistance and describe resistance uh, and all of that. Now, in subsequent studies, um, we found that compared to participatory formats, presumptive formats resulted in children receiving significantly more vaccines by the end of visits and in being significantly less under immunized over the course of multiple visits. However, as I talked to some of you this morning about it, compared to presumptive formats, participatory formats did result at least in one study in an increased odds of a highly rated visit experience by the parents. So while presumptive formats are much more effective in improving vaccination rates, they may cost providers just a little bit uh, in terms of patient satisfaction, um, which is why we suffer when we're working with Sean and motivational interviewing to try to see if we can counterbalance some of these effects. Um, okay, third case study uh, involves how do you solicit patients' full agenda of concerns? Um, primary care patients often leave visits with unmet concerns, you know, which can complicate health conditions and is super costly, actually. Um, unmet concerns are ones that patients have actively going into visits, but they never get dealt with during the visit. Research suggests still today that just over 50% of all primary care patients have more than one active concern going into visits. Um, so, you know, you make an appointment for a chronic sinus infection, uh, but maybe you also have some tingling in your feet. This actually came from an actual case that I videotaped. Patient percentage 
case, the patient does present a new second concern, uh, a sore throat, but providers almost never do. So we recorded almost 500 visits, it happened about 5% of the time. Um, now, CA studies have demonstrated that the wording of these questions actually matters, the nuanced wording of it matters. So this is gonna be more specifically a CA finding, which is that uh, there's a difference between using the word any and using the word some, okay? So um, the word any, uh, sorry, um, the word any as in, is there anything else you would like to address? Uh, any is a negative polarity device, as the linguist would call it. It builds in a preference for a no answer. Um, some is a positive polarity device. It builds in a linguistic preference for a yes answer. And so we would expect that if doctors use any versus some, it might push patients in one direction or the other. At least that's what we suspected. Now, we wanted to know if these formats were different in terms of soliciting patients' unmet concerns. Would one format work over the other? But compared to the first two case studies, we had a big problem, which is we were able to collect hundreds of cases for the first two case studies naturalistically, but this phenomenon only occurs 5% of the time. We would have had to have collect 2,000 visits if we wanted to get 100 cases of it naturally. And then even then, we wouldn't have necessarily had a split between any and some, okay? So we did a randomized controlled intervention where we trained providers to ask this question using either the any format or the sum format. Um, we had 20 family practice providers seeing patients with acute problems. 10 providers were from urban Los Angeles. 10 were from rural Pennsylvania. Each provider saw 11 patients. All patients filled out, filled out a pre-visit questionnaire because we had to figure out what concerns they were bringing to the visit. So here's a copy of one of the actual questionnaires. Question two says, please list and describe your primary reason for visiting the doctor today. And question three says, in addition to your primary reason, what other issues, problems, or concerns do you wanna talk about today? So in this case, the patient wrote lower back pain for their primary concern and then listed two additional concerns, fatigue and constipation. So by knowing what concerns patients brought to visits, we were able to determine if they ended up ultimately with unmet concerns or not. And for each provider, the first four patients were control patients. We didn't tell them about the intervention. They just business as usual, okay? No training up to this point. After the fourth patient, uh, we gave them a brief video um, that they were supposed to watch on their office computers when they went back to their office about a five, four, three and a half, four minute video, um, and it trained them to do this. So here's an example of the thumb format video that doctors received. This was done a while ago, so no, no jokes. So let's begin. We will ask that you begin each visit in your usual way by inquiring about the patient's chief medical problem. For example, when I see patients, I enter the room, I greet them and ask them, what can I do for them today? Once you find out about the chief problem and before you take a history of present illness, we'd like you to ask, are there other issues the patient would like to discuss? The words we'd like you to use are these. Are there some other issues you'd like to discuss today? Now, let me show you two examples of how we'd like you to ask these questions. All right, I understand about the cough and runny nose. Before, Before we deal we with that, that, is there, is there some, some other issue you'd like us to address during this visit? Yes, we'll also have a skin thing on my arm. Okay. All right, I understand about the sore throat and swollen glands. Before we deal with that, is there some other issue you'd like us to address during this visit? No, that's it. Okay. It's very important that you use the word some rather than the word any. Linguists have found that the teeny weeny word any is a powerful word with negative connotations. When we ask a patient, is there any other issue you'd like to address? What the patient hears us say is that we don't want to hear about their other concerns. So please don't tell me anything. Please make your questions sound like this. Okay. And then we had crafted some sticky notes, actual sticky notes, 
We put these sticky notes in the doctor's offices somewhere where the patient couldn't see them, either on the inside of the actual records that the doctor was looking at, but the patient couldn't see, or off to the side, other side of the computer that actually had the actual format that we wanted them to use. Um, so here's an example of the actual delivery of the any format. Uh, this video is going to start much earlier, um, just for context. Um, so the transcript won't show up immediately. What brought you in here today? Um, I'm sick and I've been sick for like a week, over a week probably. Oh yeah? And I just have like the cough. Like it started like it really dry. All my nose kind of stuffed up and my ears hurt really bad. Like right here and stuff. That's about it. <laughs> Is there anything else that you wanted to talk to me about today? No, that's it. Okay. Okay, in this case, the patient declines to present any additional concerns. Here's an example of the sum format. There's some other issues you'd like to discuss? Um, I do have some family history things that I wanted to discuss with you too. Oh, okay. Did I need to... In this case, the patient brings up an additional concern of actually family history of aneurysm. So it turns out to be a pretty important uh, concern. And then compared to the control visits, when providers used the sum question, patients were actually almost seven times more likely to present one of their unmet concerns, um, which was significant. And you know, when the providers used the any question, patients were more likely than control to present unmet concerns, but just not significantly, okay? So asking the question provided some impetus based on control, but asking the sum actually pushed it over into a significant situation. Um, we also measured things like time. Asking these questions actually decreased the amount of time the visit took by a couple seconds, which was kind of interesting. Okay, now, in many cases, um, providers do not consciously attend to these level of differences that CA is focusing on. They are not accurately self-reported, and to study them, you have to videotape actual behavior. Um, case three showed us that subtle communication strategies can be trained. Um, you can also use um, them to design healthcare interventions. Now, that intervention that I just showed you is relatively small scale, both in sample size and in terms of kind of the communication that we were trying to modify, that is a single sentence. Um, so I'd like to end with a final case study um, of a much larger scope. This was part of a project I did with uh, Dr. Rita Mangione-Smith on decreasing the prescription of antibiotics. Specifically, we were interested in pediatricians seeing children for acute respiratory tract infections, uh, where the inappropriate prescription of antibiotics is relatively high. Um, in these visits, I'm sorry, I'm behind here. Um, in these visits, uh, after providers prevent a, present a diagnosis, they go on to recommend a treatment was a particular type of medical action. So in most medical healthcare situations, you find there's a regular medical interactional structure and you can begin to pinpoint a particular area in that structure and start working away on it interactionally. Um, now, one response to recommending treatment is that patients, or sorry, parents immediately accept, okay? And if this happens, the visit tends to move to closure and everything's good. But another response is to resist especially the resist the no antibiotic recommendation. Um, and when patients resist, research shows that providers are significantly more likely to perceive parents as immediately expecting antibiotics, okay? And that expectation is significantly associated with actually prescribing antibiotics. So resistance tends to lead to prescription. Um, now, in actual practice, there are actually basically three ways that doctors deliver treatment recommendations. There are others, but three primary ones capture a majority of them. Um, and this was determined by qualitative CE research. First strategy is what you might call a positive treatment recommendation, where you inform the patient of treatments that will work, okay? Here is an actual case. Again, I don't have permission to play this data, but I'll read it. So the doctor says, so what I can do is give her cough medicine that has a little bit of combination of decongestant and also clearing up the nose. Oh, okay. Dry it up a little bit so at night she can sleep better. Okay. And that's the treatment recommendation. Okay. But research shows that standalone positive recommendations, standalone positive recommendations tend to lead to resistance, um, typically in the form of patients asking about antibiotics. What about antibiotics, doc? 
Won't those help? They work for me, right? Um, okay, so second strategy is what you might call a standalone negative recommendation. And this is where you inform the patients of what won't work, okay? Uh, and in this context, what won't work is antibiotics. So in this case, the provider says, as their complete treatment recommendation, you get, but in the meantime, no antibiotics or anything yet, okay? Yeah, done, okay? Um, now, this strategy um, also tends to lead to resistance, um, such as the patient not responding at all, they just remain silent. And when you present a treatment recommendation, you're supposed to get the, the parent to kind of buy into this in some way. So when parents just sit and stare, the doctors will then begin to modify their treatment recommendation. Sometimes they'll just go, hmm. Sometimes they'll say, why not? They work for me, <laughs> but he's just so sick. I mean, you get all of these things going. Now, the third strategy, which doesn't happen very often, but it does occur naturally, uh, is a two-part recommendation, sort of, or one that combines negative and positive. So in this case, the doctor says, which is good, that means she does not need antibiotics. This is the negative treatment recommendation because this is probably caused by a virus. And as you may know, antibiotics don't kill viruses. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a lot of kids get this pretty common here. So treatment will be, you know, medicine that you're gonna make her comfortable, treat her symptoms. You can get her medicine that's make her gonna make her nose less stuffy, et cetera, et cetera. So you get both negative and positive. So what we did was a randomized controlled trial this time large, it was eight states, 19 practices, 57 providers. We had over 70,000 visits, almost 30,000 patients. Um, our intervention was multifaceted. Of course, it did include education, but it primarily figured communication training. Um, and it also included some individualized prescribing feedback reports that we would give to the doctors along the way. Um, but the central part of our intervention was training pediatricians to deliver a two-part recommendation. Um, and there was some evidence early on qualitatively that it was better to be negative plus positive rather than positive plus negative. Um, and that you had to set it up, like on the one hand, on the other hand, because as soon as you get the negative, parents are gonna come in, right? So what you wanna do is you wanna get the parent prepared for a two-part recommendation, give them the negative first, then give them something actionable second. Okay, and then we're all good. So um, here's a sample of our training video, a little bit cleaner than the first one. And this begins right after the physical examination. This is what we use to train them, part of our training to get them to do this two-part recommendation. Well, he is congested, but the important thing is that his lungs sound fine and his ears look good. His throat is a little bit red, but it's nothing to be concerned about. So it looks like he has a yucky cold. On the one hand, there's no medicine that'll make it go away. Having yellow green mucus doesn't mean he has a bacterial infection, so antibiotics won't help. On the other hand, there are a bunch of things you can do to make him feel better. Okay. First thing is lots of fluids and lots of rest. Raising his head at night can help drain some of his congestion, so you might give him another pillow. You can also run a humidifier in his bedroom at night, which can help loosen the congestion and a teaspoon of honey can help his cough. All right. Okay, it all always works like that, right? <laughs> um, so our intervention significantly reduced overall prescribing for ARTIs, uh, and that actually remained significant two months after the completion of the intervention. So there seemed to be an enduring effect as well. Uh, in conclusion, uh, CA qualitatively describes the communication structure of medical actions, uh, whether it's a diagnosis, a treatment recommendation, soliciting the chief complaint, but identifying a particular medical action um, and describing its structure. Now, I didn't say much about how CA does that, about sort of the magic of CA. Caroline will do the magic for you. Uh, um, but, you know, that would take a much larger discussion of the method itself. And then CA describes the sequential effects of one medical action on another. And these uh, effects are systematic. Um, and those sequential effects are largely causal effects. Um, these effects do not arise, do not arise, uh, or depend on participants' idiosyncratic styles or particular personalities or other individuals or psychological dispositions. 
Rather, these uh, effects are rooted in rules of interaction. And that's what CA investigates, are those rules of interaction, um, which I didn't have time to elaborate on. But I've done study after study after study after study after study, and very, very rarely do any of our psychological or demographic variables affect these sequential effects. These sequential effects tend to be rooted in basic structures of interaction that kind of supersede these other things. Um, Participants can be trained to employ CA strategies. That training can endure over time. Um, and these sequential effects can be then associated also with distal health outcomes. So in sum, um, I think CA is uniquely equipped to study health communication, at least as the CDC defines it, as the study and use of communication strategies to inform and influence decisions and actions to improve health. Thank you very much. All right. I'm coming up here instead of walking around the room because they shut off all our mics. <laughs> instead of just the table mics, um, which is why my computer came up here. <laughs> oh, okay, great. Um, I was like, well, we'll just do it this way so everybody online can hear. Hopefully everyone um, online was able to hear, okay. Yeah, so I'll start here in the room. Um, John, I saw your hand up. You yeah, have a I question? Have a and... I, I have a lot of thoughts and questions, so I'll stick with one for now and okay. kind of bug you later about the others. But the, the back to your first case about the, the time that the patients spend talking about the, the, their complaint based on the introductory style, were you able to look at or, or have you thought about looking at, like, these are providers, did the providers figure that out, right? Like, if they're in a, because healthcare settings di differ in terms of how much time you have for a visit. And so are the provider, you know, some of the providers figured out like, I can get out of here quicker if yeah. I do it this way versus, yeah. you know, this this more, this, you know, better style. Yeah, so we did find a regional effect between the LA and the urban. So I was in central Pennsylvania at the time at Penn State where literally the physicians knew the names of horses of the patients. Um, visits were much longer, I think, 20, 23 minutes sometimes. Urban Los Angeles, 11.2 minutes, I think was our video. And in those, LA docs did significantly use the request for confirmation much more often than the open-ended. I don't know whether they themselves consciously knew that, but I think they had subconsciously figured it out that that leads to it. So yes, I think that you will find that providers do find ways to, to figure these things out for better or for worse. I mean, I consciously figured out the presumptive style pretty early in my career. Right. Before you, like, it was one of these things like, okay, I'm done with, you know, this other way of doing it. It's, yeah. it's time for the shots. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I mentioned this to someone earlier. There's actually a lot of research that shows that like family practice and internal medicine docs, they begin visits much differently than each other because of their training, but they actually, and they actually go through their diagnostic decision trees differently, but actually they end up with similar diagnoses. And so sometimes people will be like, well, what does it matter what they begin with if everyone gets to that same spot? Um, and I guess if they're able to get all of the concerns out and address them, then maybe there is no difference to that, other than the fact that there's also the distal results, which our patients just simply like it better. They think the doctors are better listeners and have a better socio-emotional style when they begin with that open-ended solicitation. So you might take a hit on that, even if you're not losing any medical care. Great, thank you. Um, got a question um, in the chat here about, do you see any effects on differences in conversation patterns for providers who have more rapport or knowledge of patients than those with new patients? Um, and they're relating it specifically to parents of who are vaccine hesitant um, yeah. and their patterns. Yeah, this is, the, we're relating to vaccine hesitancy specifically is what she said. Mm -hmm. um, this is difficult. This is a difficult thing that like Doug Opal and Sean and I were trying to work through, right? Which is if you have a parent that's a never vaccinator, I mean, if it's a never vaccinator and you're the pediatrician and they're showing up for their one-year appointment and they've only had one vaccine all year, beginning with, okay, John is due for 48 shots today. I mean, that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't work, right? So 
Um, doctors know this and they do know their patients. And so doctors do clearly, although this hasn't quite been documented yet, but we're gonna get there. They do clearly use a familiarity with the patients to format how they begin the visit. What we're trying to do is we're trying to kind of break that connection just a little bit, which is rather than just going to a completely participatory, so you're not gonna vaccinate again to write, huh? or you're still not vaccinating, huh? Is to try to use motivational interviewing techniques, for example, to work into then what are your concerns? How can I address your problems? To try to see if you can begin to wedge in there. But yes, the answer to the question is that doctors do use prior understandings of their patients. And this comes up mostly in like chronic care work that I've done to deal with patients. But then that runs up against, but is the strategy that you use because of that familiarity the most effective strategy or not. Yeah. Julie. Um, I noticed in your any versus some video example, a difference in body language for the provider. Mm -hmm. the, one of them was you know, facing, the legs open, arms open, the other one had her back. So I wondered how conversational analysis may handle that differences in body language and, the, and how that, if it's relevant in terms of the analysis of that intervention. Yeah, it definitely is. In just for those of you who are online, the question is about how body language uh, plays into some of that, um, those interactions and how it accounts for them. Yeah, oh. it, de it definitely does matter. Um, my dissertation looked at how doctors either are at the computer versus squared up to patients and whether they ask, the, you know, when they ask the question of, you know, what can I do for you today? And it did matter because when the physicians were squared up to the computer, patients would just wait and then doctors would turn to them and then they would start talking. Um, so those things do matter. They can be coded for. Um, they don't always matter, though, and that's, I think, the important part, is that sometimes they don't end up mattering, but they, they are things that you do want to ultimately end up, I think, taking into consideration. Yeah, eye contact and gaze and body orientation tend to be the two, the two big ones. Um, when I was at Penn State, Geisinger Health System decided they were going to install computers in every single office. And so what they did is they mailed computers to the wall and even though the bed was there. So all doctors were facing like this <laughs> at their computers. There was no like mobile computers at all. And they ultimately spent millions of dollars to redo that because they screwed up that embodiment situation. All right, what other questions in the room? Go ahead, Tristan. So I've seen a lot of peer work around obviously interactions between providers and patients. And I'm curious if there's utility or if you've done or seen work around um, conversation analysis for more uh, internal to the primary care team, so between providers sure. and staff, and how that, like, or how that's been done. Yeah, so there's been some work on like provider nurse interaction, and then there's been some work on like end of life care on provider team interaction. There's been some work in cancer care on uh, team interaction for figuring out how they're, you know, what surgery they might do and when they might do it. So there's a little bit, but not a lot, not a lot. But I think it can, I think the fundamental principles are the same. Um, so for like cancer decisions, there's some evidence that like how a surgeon begins to introduce a case matters for whether the other people buy into that or not. I have a, a question in the chat, and it's uh, one I'm particularly interested in as well, is how does conversation analysis account for some cultural um, factors? So the example they brought up is uh, the power relationships between a doctor and a patient, um, or sort of cultural views of, of a doctor and how they should behave, and how, do, how does that um, get accounted for or handled with CA? Yeah, so those, this has been a constant uh, a constant kind of thorn in CA's side, I think. Um, so the bottom line is that, you know, cult we don't tend to interact wearing our culture and our, our race, our ethnicity, our gender on our sleeve. So we rarely say I do that, you know, speaking as a white person or speaking as a Latina. I mean, so culture is particularly hard to find in interaction. That's not to say that it can't be found in interaction. And there actually have been some people that have done some very good work 
like in 911 calls, looking at how uh, Hispanic identity matters for whether health gets delivered or not. In healthcare, I think it's worth using questionnaires to ask patients about how they identify and about their cultural, cultural variables associated with them. And in a relatively traditional fashion, you can try to correlate those with your sequential practices. Um, now, I've done that. And like I said, I've been doing this for 20 years, and it's not super common that race, ethnicity, age, gender identity end up mattering in the statistical models. That doesn't mean it's not important. Um, and I would say that uh, where culture does matter a lot is in how these medical actions are understood. I mentioned to give this example earlier to someone, but like in rural Pennsylvania, doctors would recommend um, to relatively rural poor patients, doctors would recommend diet issues and they would encourage patients to incorporate more vegetables into their diet. And patients would say, yep, got that covered, great, done but yet these patients were still having all sorts of problems. Well, it turned out that in that one area of central Pennsylvania, all vegetables were fried. That's the only way they ate the vegetables was fried. That never came up. And until someone understood that, then the doctors began to say, how do you prepare your vegetables? <laughs> so there are things that once you know to ask about it, you can begin to get, to get into it. And that's where I think, ethnography plays a big role. Uh, you wanna be able to get in, shadow these clinics. If you're particularly working from a cultural perspective, you can see things that might not be seen uh, by other people. Yeah, great. Um, and I think Sean had a follow-up to Tristan's yeah. question there. It, it got me thinking, that, you know, this, this um, concept of certain uh, surgeon, how the surgeon prevents it or whatever. Have you seen evidence in your work among, say, individual clinicians where they will they figure this stuff out and depending on the agenda, depending on what they want to do, they will present things in different manners? So like they kind of intuitively know that how one, that, how, like, like any or someone or whatever technique you can, you can name, that they will vary how they do things based on a particular agenda that they may have. So the question is about, you know, whether some providers are perceptive enough to figure out some of these things and uh, change based on their own agenda in, in interactions with patients. In some cases. So I'm working on some stuff right now where I'm looking at, uh, we'll have to talk about this in the, the workshop later. It's uh, women diagnosed recently with breast cancer seeing surgeons uh, for when surgery is going to happen. Most of these women are seeing the doctor within 72 hours of diagnosis. And one question they often ask is, when am I going to have surgery? Uh, and I believe that some of those surgeons know that the right answer is, I know you want this surgery now, but you've got six to eight weeks to make a good decision so that you don't have regret later. So let me tell you about all the different people you really should be talking to before you make that decision. But then they can also just say next week. <laughs> um, I do think that some surgeons recognize that they, at that point, they've got this opportunity. The question doesn't tend to come up until later in the visits. And so sometimes if these has been going on for 50 or 60 minutes, surgeons might decide I'll just schedule surgery and be done because explaining that to, parent, to, to patients usually requires some time um, because parents don't like to hear that. I mean, women don't like to hear that. Um, my guess is that they do have an intuitive sense and it's not a nefarious thing. I think right. like you said, it's just a, I know where I am. This is the first patient of the day. I don't have another 20 minutes to spend, et cetera, et cetera. But there's not been a lot, a lot there hasn't been a lot of work looking at that specific question. All right, we've got time for one more question in the room. I'll ask one more. So I'm curious about, um, your thoughts on the Hawthorne effect and the bias that that mm -hmm. might introduce with mm -hmm. a couple of analysis? Yeah, so we know that there is a Hawthorne effect. Um, when you videotape doctors, uh, they do tend to slide towards the pro-social scale, okay? Um, but the way I look at it is this, well, A, we can't do our work without videotaping people. B, um, my IRBs are not... Uh, deceptive, but they also are very carefully worded in terms of what I let providers know that I'm looking at. 
Uh, and C, and I think the most important thing is that if without the videotaping, without any observation, providers might have done strategy A 50% of the time and strategy B 50% of the time. And then when videotaped, they might do strategy A 70% of the time <laughs> and strategy B 30% of the time because they know that they are supposed to or should do strategy A. All that tends to affect is the distribution of the sequential strategies, but it doesn't affect the, like the effects of those strategies. So you can still see that strategy A leads here and strategy B leads here. You just have a slightly different distribution of it. Um, so while the Hawthorne effect may affect the distribution of the sequential strategies, it doesn't really affect kind of the sequential effects of those strategies themselves or necessarily their effects on outcomes of care. So you didn't say a lot about outcomes of care. And of course, all of the, with the exception of the art of medicine school or you know, what patients think, everything else is pushing clinicians to take all the shortcuts they can to get ahead of their incredible overloaded patients. Yeah. So have you, have you or have other people shown a detriment in um, you know, in terms of um, a detriment in, in what way? Well, let's say you get that shortcut and, and, and you um, Short don't get the entire right. you know, three things that, that we're really worried about. Right. Um, how much uh, work has been done to show that kind of detriment in outcomes? Right. Um, relatively little in a longitudinal sense, which is I think where CA really needs to go, which is we need to be, be tracking effects of interaction over interaction over interaction. But I think the one area where, um, I think I might've mentioned this to you this morning is that in my study of breast cancer care, I was trying to find out, I was measuring hopeless, patients' hopelessness, because we know that hopelessness is linked to mortality and recurrence of breast cancer. And it was, I really wanted to study this because I wanted to be able to show that how doctors, how surgeons communicated with patients actually affected patients' post-visit hopelessness. And I measured pre and post and adjusted for change. And I was actually able to show that certain communication strategies increased versus decreased patients' hope post-visit. And the reason why I looked at that outcome precisely was because it's a way to say, you know, from the surgeon's perspective, they're getting surgery A or B, it's the best, get rid of the but it doesn't really address the issue of how the women perceive that in terms of hope. And that actually is a hugely consequential outcome. Now, I didn't track it to mortality, of course, but I think once we start measuring outcomes like that, we will be able to show doctors that communication, that bedside manner, which is of course the death knell for CA. Everyone says, oh, you study bedside manner. Well, yeah, but, um, but that, that it does matter for outcomes that are not, as tangible as things. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. You're um, welcome. This is a really wonderful uh, entree to conversation analysis. Um, thank you for all of you who are here in the room. If you haven't grabbed one yet, make sure you get a, um, an evaluation for today. Um, and for those of you who are online and in the room, our next seminar in the series is March 1st, and we'll be looking at digital storytelling as a, as a research method. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.